Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to see you guys today. Um, I do apologize for my, my voice. I, I, I'm not sick. I just woke up this morning and it decided not to show up. Or, or we could say that I've got something really important to tell you today and the devil just doesn't want you to hear it. So we're going we're gonna to push through and I'm just going to push through for you guys. Um, yeah, and also I just want to say if, you, if I didn't get a chance to talk to you uh, before the service this morning, you know, things were a bit busy this morning. I do, I do love you. I do care about you, especially if you're new. Uh, so stick around afterwards so that I do get a chance to connect with you today. So like Simon said, this is part four of a, of a series that we're doing called The Power to Change. And, and the whole reason that I wanted to do this is because I felt like a lot of us have, a thing, have these things in our life that we want to change, but we just kind of feel powerless about it. And I don't know if you've gotten to the place where things have changed in your life after we've done this for four weeks or, or not. I don't know. I don't know what's changed in you or what hasn't changed in you. But I, thank you. I want to talk about the why uh, this morning. Why am I doing this? And why are we doing this? We're, we're doing this. And, and the reason I'm going to talk to you today, the why is, is that I, I care about you. And we believe in you. And so if you've made it through this whole series and nothing's really resonated with you and nothing's really changed in your life or you don't feel like you've been equipped with what you need to be equipped with in order to make the changes that you want to make, then I just want you to know that today the why is that I love you, we love you, and that God loves you. And so you could be anywhere in the world, but you're not, you're here. And right now, here in this moment, for the next 35 minutes or so, you're going to get an opportunity to just relax and to sit back and know that the reason you're here is because there's a God that loves you, whether you believe in him or not. And so let's go back to our, our first slide here. We're talking about, in, in our, our power to change, we're talking about breaking the cycle that's breaking your life. That, that, that's quite a, you know, kind of a, a big title there. It, it means a lot. But basically, we talked about habits a couple weeks ago before uh, Easter. And what we talked about is we talked about the habit that you needed to start. And then now what we're talking about today is we're talking about the habit that you need to stop. So we talked a lot about in the last message about could you just start one healthy spiritual habit? Could you just, could you just start one little thing? But today when we talk about habits that we need to stop, we're not going to talk about a little thing, a little habit that we need to stop. We're going to talk about a life-changing, life-altering thing that I hope you'll be encouraged and I hope you'll be equipped to be able to stop. And in order to do that, I need to talk about our lives and our daily lives. We see, when we have all these habits that we can't start, the good habits, time management, financial management, uh, getting up early, working out, all of those little things. But then when you combine your inability to start good habits with your inability to stop bad habits... Maybe it's addiction, or maybe it's the way you talk to each other, or relationships that you have, or whatever it is. When you combine those two, then you get a really hard life. And, and in that really hard life, and I, I believe this for everybody, no one really wakes up and just plans to mess up their lives. It, it's not, no one does this. No one says, you know what, my goal is just to totally mess up my life today. And in fact, to go even further, none of us end up in a place where, I mean, maybe this is you, maybe it's not, where you just sort of like wake up one morning or one afternoon and you look around and you're like, my life is a disaster. You know, how on earth did it get to this point? And, and whether you're in financial disaster or whether it's, um, you know, a relationship disaster or whether it's, the, you know, the baby's crawling through the front yard and the dogs are out of the gate and the kitchen's a mess and there's honey dripping off of something and everything is sticky. And, and you're just saying, how did chaos get into my house? How, how did this happen in my life? See, it, it's not something the point I'm trying to make here for you is this isn't something that's instant. You know, our life doesn't get messed up because of just an instant thing. Our, our lives, we don't just wake up and find ourselves instantly in a mess or in a disaster. You may think that you are, but I can promise you, I can relate that back to a pattern of things that has led you exactly where you are. So I don't know about you, but I know that sometimes I feel it. I feel like my life's a mess sometimes. And so it's okay for you to feel like life is a mess for you sometimes. 
And, and in this message today, I just want us to be open, real, honest. I want us to be really authentic with each other here. And we're all a mess at times. But we don't get there instantly. And we don't plan on being there. So then, how do we end up at a place where our life is a mess. So I, how do people tend to kind of like mess up their lives? There's, there's three ways here. And, and the first one that's going to come up here on the screen is it's one bad decision. Okay? So that we're talking about how do we mess up our lives. We've got one bad decision. And then next we've got one wrong step. And then the last part is we've got one harmful habit. So one bad decision one wrong step, and one harmful habit. But like I said, this isn't something that's instant. It's not something that uh, just happens one time, and then all of a sudden, you're in a bad place in your life. Uh, you know, I remember being in uh, like middle school, and you have all this pressure to take these tests. And I remember thinking, like, man, you know, if I fail this test, because they're saying, you know, if you fail this test, it's going to place you in a uh, a class, you know, a different class, and da 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 Basically, they're saying, we're trying to figure out who's smart and who's dumb. And I'm trying to figure out, well, am I smart or am I, you know, how's this going to impact my whole life? And I just remember thinking, like, there's no way this one test can actually have an impact on the rest of my life. Okay, there's just no way that it can. So it's not just one bad decision, one wrong step, and one harmful habit. There's actually something that we add to it, and it's this one at a time. So one bad decision at a time, one wrong step at a time, one harmful habit at a time. And, and that's how we end up in a place where our lives kind of feel like a mess. Because we've made, over a period of time, we've made a series of bad decisions, one at a time, one at a time. We've taken steps in the wrong direction, one at a time, one at a time. We've, made, uh, we've formed harmful habits, one at a time, one at a time. And, and then when we put all that together, all the little one at a times, we end up in this place where we look around and we're like, okay, my life is a little bit of a mess here. It, it kind of sneaks up on you. Does anybody feel that way? If, if you're listening, say, I am. Okay, I'm glad somebody is listening. You guys are quiet this morning. So let's be, let's be honest. Let's, be, let's, let's break the quiet here. Because I want to make sure that you're, you're hearing this. I want to make sure that you're feeling this, that you're hearing what God has to say for you. Or if you don't know God at all, I want, to, I want to make sure that this at least influences or it has something that triggers some train of thought in your mind. So let's talk about this. What are the areas in life that you can mess up? Okay, these are the areas in life. And this is not a definitive answer. But all of the different areas in life that you can mess up. As I made a list about these the other day, I worked myself into a panic attack full of anxiety. Because I was like, this list is really long. And then I started like checking the ones off that are in my life. And I thought, okay, I need to be done here. This is not healthy for me to work through this. But, you know, I'm talking about things like your finances. You know, you can mess up your finances one bad decision at a time. You can mess up your relationships with people one bad decision at a time, one bad step in the wrong direction at a time, one bad habit at a time can mess that up. What else do we have? It could be your health, it could be diabetes, that can mess up your life. Um, it could be uh, not going for an eye exam and then getting into a car wreck because you can't see. Um, it could be, what else could we have here? Um, as a parent, it could be with your kids, you know, you could feel like you did something there to mess up your life. Because, um, you know, parents, the decision that your kids make, it's always your fault, right? It always reflects, you know, back onto you, right? No. Answer that's no. So, how many different things in our life can we mess up? I, I had a list of like 10, 15 things. As I just thought about all the different stuff that can mess up in your life. And so, what I want you to think about, when we think about the areas in our life that can mess up? And this is a practical question. It's very practical. Is, is this, what, what have it's been haunting you for so long? Well, what, what's the thing that, and we're kind of going to switch and pivot here. You know, so many young men, old men, young men, and even ladies now, even girls, they've got this thing that's been haunting them for such a long time. That they feel like they can't get over, they can't beat, they can't do anything about it. No matter how hard they try, they can't overcome it. They're a slave to it. The rest of their life looks wonderful and it looks perfect. Everything looks like it's fallen into place. 
They can come to church. They can have good relationships with people. But in the dark, in the night, in the, in the, the solitude of their room, this thing comes up over and over and over and over and over again. It's an addiction to pornography. You know, a, another thing could be, um, you know, you, you're trying to kick a habit of drugs. You know, I'm talking about hardcore drugs like, like heroin or tick or uh, I don't know what else is there. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that's out there. If you go to the state of Florida and America, they eat bath salts and then try and eat each other. It's like a zombie movie down there. Florida is the most dangerous state in America. If you go, stay away from Florida. You know, but I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about that little extra pill that you take at night so that you go to sleep. Or I'm talking about that little extra pill that you take so that it keeps you awake so that you can do the things that you want to do that day. See, the, the thing about this is that this habit that's been haunting you for so long, this is the thing that happens in secret in your heart. See, every single person has this little hidden part, that this little secret that they don't project, they don't broadcast, they don't bring their accountability partner, their pastor, their friends, or even their spouse into most of the time. And it's this little secret that you carry, and it's haunting because it weighs on you, and it just talks to you, and it redefines you over and over and over again, and it makes you feel disqualified and unvalidated. But that thing in you, that thing you can't control, you can't overcome, that's the thing I want to pull to the front of your mind here. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that thing. Now, here in a minute, I'm going to ask, I'm going to name some of these, and if it's you, I want you to raise your hand, okay? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, just making sure you guys are alive. So, when you think about this haunting habit, it's important that the first thing that you do is you've got to define the habit that you want to break. Because if you can't, if you can't define it, you can't defeat what you cannot define. So you, you've actually got to define it. And for some of us, that means that we've got to claim it. We've got to say, you know what, fine. I am just going to accept the fact that I am addicted to this little pill at night that helps me to go to sleep and I can't not have it. Or I'm going to just accept and name the fact that I cannot overcome pornography. Or I'm going to accept and name the fact that I am dependent on alcohol and I can't have relationships or be in social circumstances without it. I'm going to accept the fact that I cannot stand my relationship with my spouse because I'm holding on to some kind of anger or some kind of hurt that's in me, but I'm, I'm no longer going to let it sit at the back of my head. Instead, I'm going to bring it out, and I'm going to name it, and I'm going to claim it because if we, don't, if we don't define it, then you can never break it. The first step towards getting over that, that secret that you carry in your heart is to just define it. It's to say, okay, this is what it is. I'm just, here it is. This is me. This is what I struggle with. And we've got some amazing people in this church that I've had, you know, come forward and have reached out to other people and they've told this little haunting secret to them and they've gotten accountability and they've gotten help. And guess what? Their life has moved on beautifully. There's people that don't live in, in, in this, uh, this prison to these habits that just run our lives and dictate who we think that we are. So define it so that today we can defeat it. Not next week, not Monday, not the next, the next, the next. And, and, and as, when I say that we, we can defeat it today, I know that immediately you're thinking, yeah, no, it's not going to be today. Because I've tried yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before and the year before and it's never happened. So why today? Well, remember what I said at the beginning of this? You could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here. And you're here because God has something to say to you. And so let me back this up by, by the Bible here. He always wants you to know where I find this stuff in the Scripture. James 1.21. This is James, and he says this. And what I love about the book of James, this is kind of like a handbook for how to live your life. So as, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, or even if you're not a Christ follower, if you want to know how a Christ follower should live their life, you can, you can read through the book of James. And so in 121, he says this. So get rid of, cast it out, name it, claim it, defeat it. Get rid of uncleanliness. So that would be sin that remains of wickedness. And with 
with a humble spirit, receive the word of God, which is implanted. So that means it's actually rooted in your heart and it's able to save your souls. See, there, there's this, there's a reason that we don't give this to God. There's a reason that that thing that you're holding on to stays with you and it doesn't go to God. And here's the reason for that. The, the reason is that because you think you can deal with it. Because you think you can overcome it. Or you think you can live with it. You think that, that you can make peace with it and that you can separate that side of your life out and you can push it to the side and then you can continue on with the life, this other life that people see, this public life. But you can't do that. And, and, and the reason that that has never brought you freedom is because that, that's pride. That's a form of pride. Pride isn't always just thinking that we're amazing. Pride is sometimes thinking, I can do this, I don't need to give this to God. And what James here is saying is have a humble spirit. See, when you have a humble spirit and you realize I am an absolute utter failure at defeating this habit. And God looks at you and says, good, finally. Now that you've finally gotten to a place where you realize that you are not enough to defeat this and overcome it. Then humble yourself, which is like saying, God, I just can't do it anymore. Maybe you can do it. And when you do that, you receive the word of God. So you receive God's truth. What does God say? God says you're more than a conqueror. What does God say? God says that you're blessed. God says that you're, uh, you're an heir to his kingdom. God sent Jesus to die for you because he so loved you. That's the truth that God says. That's the word of God. And when you put humility out in front of yourself and you confess this and you humble your heart, you receive the word of God, which means that all the truth of God that God gives us is implanted into your heart. It's, it's like putting a bag of rooibos tea in water. You can take the tea bag out, but you'll never be able to separate the, the tea from the water again. They're infused together. And, and that's what it means. It's going to be actually rooted in your heart. And then that's able to save your soul. So your, your soul matters. But why is this so hard to us? So it, here it's like I, I say this and we think, okay, this is great. Like I can just, I can give this to God. I can humble myself. And when I humble myself, I'm done. But why is it so hard for us to humble ourselves? Why is it so hard for us to tell other people about these things? Why is it so hard to admit that you have a problem? Why is it so hard to admit that, that whatever the habit that you need to break... And your life is, why is it so hard to do that? See, that comes down to good habits versus bad habits. And, and, and I've written something for you here. Hey, listen to this. Good habits are hard to start, right? Because the pain is now and the payoff is later. It's hard to start the habit of going to the gym because the pain is now and the payoff is later. Uh, about a year ago... I don't know how many people remember this. A year ago, I started going to the gym and working out with uh, my friend David, who's a trainer at Virgin Active. And, and this is almost exactly a year ago because uh, it was before Wyatt was born, and you guys threw us a diaper party. And so we had this, I had this amazing, huge pile of, of nappies, and it was just incredible. But before that, I'd had a couple sessions with David, first sessions in the gym, and because we did like arms one day, I, I got permanently stuck like this for about a week and a half. Seriously, like a T-Rex. I couldn't extend, I could not extend my arms. My biceps were so messed up that I, I could not, I, I literally just couldn't extend my arms. Before coming out here to, to speak, I'll never forget that Sunday of me just standing back there and hooking my arms to the table and just trying to stretch them out so that I didn't come out here and preach like, like a bird, like a chicken. You know, and, and that's because, like, hey, starting the habit of going to the gym is really, really hard. But the, the payoff does come later, but it's, it's hard to start. I, you know, people, I used to run a lot. People would say, you know, I hate running. It hurts so bad. It's like, well, of course it does because you've not done it long enough to reap the benefit of it. This could also be um, your relationships with your family. There's a million things that this could apply to. Any good habit is hard to start because the pain is now, the payoff is later. Bad habits, as we're talking about today, they're hard to break. Why? Because the payoff is now and the pain is later. 
Man, it's really hard for you to break that habit of that thing you take, that thing you look at, that thing you do, that person you talk to, that thing you believe about yourself, the thing you tell yourself over and over and over again. It's really hard to break that because the payoff of continuing to do that is now the pain is later. It's really hard to stop having that drink because when you have that drink, the payoff is then. It's now. And the pain comes when you stop. That comes later. That, that, that's why it's so hard. Are we making sense? Are we speaking to somebody in here? So now what I wanted to do is I want to put us into the shoes of a man named Samson. And, and I'm going to quickly take you through Samson's life. And, and where, man, I would love to just, I may do a whole series on him. Because as I uncovered his story, it just so many amazing things came out of it. But Samson, he was the last of Israel's judges. And so Israel had, I think, 20, and he was the last one. These were people that God appointed to kind of judge over Israel and take care of them. And Samson was the last one. We find his story in Judges 13 through 16. If you've never read the Bible and you want to read something that's like a little bit racy, a little bit saucy, it's got prostitutes in it, it's got murder in it, it's got a, a, a dude kills a thousand men with a donkey's jawbone, like, go there, okay? Get excited about the Bible. This happens here, Judges 13 through 16. Parents, you want to get your kids invested? Here you go. So Samson was this guy, and, and where Samson came from is his parents were infertile. His parents couldn't have kids. And an angel shows up and talks to Samson's mom and says, Hey, I'm going I'm to give you a kid. You're going to have a kid. And she's like, That's amazing, but her husband wasn't there. And so then they start asking, you know, Can this angel please come back? The angel comes back and tells both Samson's dad, Manoah, and his mom, It's true. You're going to have a kid. And when you have this kid, there's some things I need you to do. As soon as you're pregnant, don't drink any wine. Don't even touch a grape. If it comes near you, have kick it. Roll it down the hill. Don't even go in a vineyard. Don't go near it. No raisins, no prunes, nothing. Stay away from all that stuff. Don't eat, don't eat unclean food. But he gives her a list. And she says, okay. So she gets pregnant. And, and before that happens, this is where I would love to do a whole message on, that M Manoah doesn't want to let the angel go, and he has this whole conversation with him, what's your name? And basically he finds out it's Jesus. Jesus was in angelic form. And so he says, can I feed you? And he's like, no, I want you to, to do a sacrifice instead. And, and so Manoah you know, cuts his, you know, does the sacrifice, and he burns it. And as the flames are going up, Jesus actually disappears into the smoke going up to, to heaven. It's really cool. Again, you can read it on your own. And so then Manoah and his, his wife are like, okay, this must be real. This is quite an amazing thing here. We just watched this dude disappear. I'm pretty sure that that was an angel of the Lord. That was the Lord. And so they have Samson. And when Samson is born, he takes on this thing called like a Nazarite vow. And so that means that he can't cut his hair. It means that he can't touch uh, a dead animal or anything dead. It also means that he's got to portion a side of his life out so that he can dedicate it to prayer and, and to kind of worshiping the Lord. That's the Nazarite vow. Normally it has, it's a voluntary thing you step into. And normally it has a start date and it has an end date. But not for Samson. Samson was born into it and he wasn't given an end date. God just said, this is your boy. This is how he is. Now for those of us that know the story, when we think of Samson, we know the story about his hair being long and wonderful and beautiful. And he was full of muscles and... He was really strong, but you know what? Just to burst your bubble a little bit, the Bible doesn't say that he was strong because of his muscles. It, that may not be in there. Samson may have been this tall and this wide. He may have been one ugly dude. We don't know. We don't. But what I do know is that his strength, and the Scripture tells us this, came from the power of the Lord. So it doesn't matter what he looked like or how big or short or fat or dumpy or whatever he was. Because his strength came from the Lord. And so Samson is born and he grows up and he's supposed to take on this Nazarite vow. And he pretty much breaks it in every single way. Now, this is what I want you to imagine. So you're Samson, all right? God preordained and predestined that you would be here on this planet. God thought about you, God created you, God planted the seed in you, He got your parents together, they did a thing, and here you are. 
That God did that. He promised you into existence. Just like he did to Samson's parents. Now when you're born, you're born a sinner. Just Samson was born a sinner, but he was born into this vow. You, you guys have an opportunity when you're born, you're born a sinner. But then you have an opportunity to enter into a vow with God. That vow is different. Jesus came, he died on the cross. We just had Easter. There's a cross over there if you need an illustration. Jesus hung there, he died so that you could step into a new vow with God, have forgiveness of your sins, be completely blameless, and have your relationship with the Lord restored. So you're Samson. And even though you've got this vow, and even though you've got God that's promised you all these amazing things, has God promised to use Samson to free and to help the Israelites? Guess what Samson does? He totally respects his Nazarite vow by literally breaking every single aspect of it. He drinks wine, he gets drunk, he has a bachelor party, he marries a Philistine woman, which means that she's, it's, it's basically being unequally yoked, so he's an Israelite. A Philistine woman would have worshipped other gods. And because the two of them weren't like yoked and equal together, their marriage was like a little bit of a disaster. In fact, she tried to trick him because uh, the Philistines were like, hey, you need to tell us why Samson's so strong, otherwise we're going to burn you and your dad alive. And so she tricks him, and Samson had told a riddle at the wedding. It's, I'm, and I'm kind of jumping all over the place. you got to read this thing. All right, you got to. Samson gets married. Okay, listen, at his, at his bachelor party, gets hammered, gets married, makes a bet. And the bet is for 30, imagine, suits, 30 suits. And I know nobody in here ever gets hammered. Nobody in here ever makes any bets, despite the fact that the Lord died for you. And so Samson does this, and he tells a riddle. And, and nobody can guess it. And he says, you've got three days to guess it or else I win. And so they go to, because, you know, men are prideful. They go to, to Samson's wife and they say, hey, get him to tell us. And she just nags him to death. And she finally, he tells her the answer. And then she goes and tells uh, the, the Philistines, the people that were threatening her. They solve Samson's riddle. So Samson's like, all right, I owe you these 30 garments. So here's what I'm going to do. He goes down to the next village and kills 30 Philistines and grabs their clothes and brings it back and says, there's your payment. He's a crazy dude. Then after that, Samson leaves and then he comes back again and he finds out that his wife's dad gave her to somebody else and he shows up and he's like, wait a minute, she's, you've given her in marriage to somebody else? He's like, well, I thought you hated her, so I gave her away. So Samson gets mad, and he takes, the, the, the Bible talks about foxes, but it's actually jack, maybe jackals. And he lights their tails on fire and sets them off in the fields and burns all their crops down. And so then the Philistines, they light and they burn Samson's wife and her father. They, they burn them. And so then Samson gets mad about that, and that's when he picks up a, 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 a donkey's jawbone and kills a thousand men with it. It just one man just knocks out a thousand with that. And so Samson has, has this go back and forth. And I don't even have time to go into the, to the rest of Samson's kind of messed up part there. But, but Samson ends up turning himself in to the Israelites. Because they say, do you were causing so much problems for us? And he turns himself in. And then he, he goes over to the Philistines. And then he kind of like gets free. And then he kills a bunch of them again. And, and so it's just... Like over and over and over again, Samson just is killing Philistines. Just kind of what God was intending Samson to do was to free the Israelites to, to do a number on the Philistines. And so where, where I want us to kind of relate to, to Samson on is that Samson was promised as a Nazarite. He was promised in a certain way with God. But Samson's life was one mess after one mess after one mess. How did he get there? One step, one decision, and one habit at a time. Samson loved women. That got him hooked up with prostitutes. And he mar ended up marrying two different Philistine women. Both of them wrecked his life. The second one was Delilah. She's the one that ended up getting his hair cut off. Which ends up him losing his strength. And when he loses his strength... The Philistines, they capture him because he didn't know he lost his strength. I could imagine him walking out of the tent, feeling all like buff and proper and ready to go. And one of the Philistines' guards comes up to him, and Samson's like, God, we're going to donkey jaw this thing all over again. And he, he just he hits him, but the, the soldiers just stands there like, and I could just, the panic on Samson's face was probably like, oh, man, something's wrong here. 
I don't have my power. And so Samson, without his power, he ends up getting taken captive. And what they do is they gouge his eyes out. They, they blind him. And that was a practice that they would do. So they blind Samson so that he can no longer see. And they tie him to a grain mill. And so all he did was he pushed this grain mill in a circle and it ground up the grain. The great and mighty Samson has come to a place in his life where his eyes are gouged out and he just like a slave, he's pushing a grain mill. In fact, the Bible says that it was a young boy that helped him because Samson was blind. He was so broken as a person that a little boy could guard him. And so how does he get there from being so great to being so broken? How do we, how do, we do that? From God promising so much in your life to now your life may be so broken because of a habit. It's a thing that we talked about last time called the habit cycle. And this habit cycle, it, it, it starts with a cue. So I talked about you know, my weakness towards petrol stations and candy bars there. The cue would be driving down Forest Drive and seeing the, the BP. And then comes the craving. Hey, I know that there's, a, uh, that there's a bar one in that petrol station. The response would be, I don't know what's happening. My hands are moving and I'm turning in. And all of a sudden, I wake up, I'm back in my car, and there's an empty bar one wrapper. That's the way this habit cycle works. And then the next time you go by a petrol station, the queue happens again. And so the problem here with us, and that's why this is yellow, is this queue part. And so... You know, with Samson, what, what was Samson's cue? I would say that Samson's cue was, was his, his eyes, what he could see, and it was women. And if you read the story, you'll find out that women always led him down the wrong path. And that was what it was in his heart, and it caused a lot of pride. And so through the window of Samson's eyes, you found Samson's cue. Now, look at what's amazing here. Is it's amazing about this. Samson's greatest feat came when his cue was removed. So when Samson's eyes were gouged out, Karina, you can put that on the screen there. When Samson's eyes were gouged out, his greatest feat came. And that greatest feat was a story where he was, he was taken to, to be made fun of by, the king, by all the, the Philistines. And they're making fun of him. They're you know, just really tormenting him. And he stands there and he prays and he asks God, God, give me the strength one more time. And Samson... Stands in between the two pillars. He asks the little boy that's guarding him. He says, hey, take me to the, pil- these, the two pillars that hold this thing up. And for some reason, the Philistines built an entire building with 3,000 people in it with only two pillars holding the whole thing up. And so Samson gets in between them and he says, God, give me the strength. And he prays and God gives him the strength and he pushes them down. The building collapses. 3,000 Philistines die. Samson also died. But 3,000 of them died. More died in that than he ever did, you know, in combination up to that point. So what's crazy is when Samson's eyes were removed and the lust was removed from his heart and Samson was broken and humbled, then the greatest feat of his life came. And so when we remove our cue, then you can expect the greatest feat in your life to come. So... Just in kind of wrapping this up, I just would ask you, like, do you, do you like the direction that that habit in your heart is taking you? Do you like that? You know, S- Samson, uh, if you look at the direction of his life, he, he actually literally had to walk like 40 miles to get to the Philistine land so that he could sleep with a prostitute. His cue of lust in his heart, his habits took him in a certain direction. Do you like the direction that your habits are taking you? Is, it, is, is that where you want to go? So think about it. Take that dark secret habit that you have, the one you don't want to tell anybody about, and just add five years to it. What's that look like in five years? Do you like that? Do you still want to be that? Do you still want to find yourself there? I hope not. Because there's freedom for you. There's something that's better for you. And so if you don't like the direction that it's take you, if not, then remove the cue. Now, I pray that God doesn't put you through anything, you know, that like God didn't pull Samson's eyeballs out. 
Samson did that. Samson led himself to that place. His habits led him to that place in his life. God just worked through it. He just turned it into something good. So I, I don't want to see you guys walk down a pathway that leads you to a very hurtful and hard place. Unfortunately, some of us only get there the hard way. And that's just how we are. But if you don't like the direction that you're going, remove the cue. What is it in your life that triggers the habit that you don't want to carry anymore, but you don't feel like you can get rid of it? That cue, we got to change that. And that can mean that you drive a different way. You don't drive by a petrol station. It can mean that you get your computer and your cell phone out of your room at night. It could be that you say sorry to a family member. It could be that you stop thinking certain thoughts about yourself. You know what? Maybe you need to get rid of the mirror in your bedroom. Maybe you need to go buy a skinny one. There's one at Virgin Active I love. There's one. One panel. That's the one I stand in front of. I'm like, yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. You know, I don't know what it is in, your, in, in you, but there's something that triggers something. Take the thing that triggers the thing in you and change something about it. Change it. We see that the habits that you have today, they're going to determine who you become tomorrow. It's just like the same thing that happened to Samson. The habits you have right now determine who, you have, who you're going to become tomorrow. And I, I, I want to see you become something greater and better than you are now. Can I just can I say that? That I want to see you become something better and greater than you are now. See, this is a truth I think some of you need here. And, and this is we're going to end on this. The truth is, is that you're not what you did. Okay? You're not the porn that you watched last night. You're not the beverage that you drank too much of. You're not the pill that you took. You're not the thought that you thought. You're not the mean person that you were. Whatever it is that you did, that's, you're not that. Because see, you were made in the image of God. So you're not what you did. You are someone made in the image of God who Christ died for. You've been completely set free. You're just not acting like it. Because you've got a habit that's taking you in a direction away from that. You're also not what you're doing now. But if you don't change your cue, if you don't change your habit, you will become more of it if you don't turn away from it. It's like Samson. He didn't change and he became more and more and more and more of it. And see, what I want you to know, those of you that feel like you can't change, those of you that feel like there's nothing in you that can actually give you freedom from this thing, that I'm just wasting hot air, now I want you to know one more truth, and it's that Christ in you is stronger than the wrong desires in you. But that hinges on one thing, Christ in you. Is Christ in you? If he's not, we can take care of that. If he is, then you've got to change your habit and your direction. And take yourself towards God because he's there. He's standing there. You know, in Samson's life, you know, he only prayed to God two times. That's it. He prayed to God once after he killed a thousand men. He was thirsty and he said, God, please give me a drink of water. And God opened up a spring for him. Second time he prayed was when he was standing in between the pillars. He said, God, grant me one more feet of strength. Two times. We can pray all day long, every day. Christ in you. I, I want to help you get Christ in you. Andrew is a great picture of Christ in you. It's Christ in you. It's not your willpower is greater than the wrong desires in you. It's not your strength is greater than the wrong desires in you. It's not your accountability in your friends is greater than the wrong desires in you. It's not your plan. It's not your boundaries. It's not your, uh, your whatever it is. It's not your system that's around you that is greater than the wrong desires that are in you. That's why you keep failing. Instead, it's Christ in you. Humble yourself. Let God's word come and fill you. Let God's promises fill you. And when Christ is in you, it's stronger than all the desires are that are in you. And so I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we're going to pray, and the band's going to come out and worship. And I, I really want to give, give us time for our prayer partners to come forward and, and you guys to come down. And 
a chance to pray with them. So listen, I, I have worked through so much of this in my life personally. I, and, I, and I continue to. There's so many little habits and dark secrets in my life that I've worked through over and over and over and over again. And sometimes I take these, these pathways that take me to a new dark secret or a new habit. And I work through it again and again and again and again and again. You know what one of the biggest dark secrets is in me that I struggle to overcome? It's believing. It's believing that it can change. And the reason that that's, a, that that's a bad habit, the reason that's a bad direction to go, is that's like saying, I don't know that I believe that God can change me. I don't know that I believe that God can change this habit or this, this secret that I carry. And so what do I do with it? I just confess it over and over and over again. God, I don't believe that this is the moment that this thing can change in my life, but I'm going to just say I believe in you. I'm going to just declare it out loud. Remember, name it, claim it, defeat it. If you don't name it and claim it, you can't defeat it. So today, you get the opportunity today, and I hope you take it. Because whatever you walked in as can be different from how you walk out. Name it, claim it, defeat it. We're going to have prayer partners that are going to come up here on the sides, and they're there for you. you can, for anything at all that you need prayer for, you can come up and get prayer. Anything at all. But specifically, if you're ready to name, claim, and defeat then when the band comes out here, after I say amen and they start to sing, I just immediately, I want you to get up. I want you to come down front. We're all going to be standing. No one's going to know that you're, it's, it's a good private thing. And if you don't have the strength to do it then, then our prayer partners will stay after the service. You can come up to them then. So today is your opportunity to name, claim, and defeat because we can help Christ be in you. So, Heavenly Father, I just pray that through this word and through this message that, um, that you just, man, I, I pray for courage in this room. I pray that there's courage in every single person's heart. That, that they, they see you, they see a glimpse of you, that it is just enough for them to take courage and to say, no, I'm going to name it, I'm going to claim it, and Christ, you're going to defeat it. And all I have to do is just let you Work in me, let you be in me. It's Christ, it's you that's in me that can defeat these things. It's, it's not me, it's you. So Lord, I pray that a humble spirit falls on this whole auditorium. And that everybody here that's listening that can hear me, their heart just softens, their ears open up, their senses come alive. And Lord, they just feel your presence here. Even those that don't know you, God, let them just feel at ease and let them feel comfortable. Let them feel like this is a safe space. And Lord, I pray that you move. And so, God, I pray over everyone that's going to have the courage to stand up and name, claim, and defeat that thing in their life, that they will then be able to take a different direction, a direction that they want to go in. So, Jesus, we pray these things in your name. We declare it in your name, Jesus. Amen.